Hello everybody, welcome to Drydock episode 121, and this week's questions are taken from Guide 186, the Guide to the Colossus Class Battleships, and the Guide to USS Birmingham. Josh Thomas Moore asks, What was the thinking behind using battleships and battle cruisers as carrier escorts? It comes down to three factors, two major and one minor. The more minor one is that large capital ships, battleships, and battle cruisers tended to have a fairly significant amount of operational range, and therefore between the range and their speed they could normally keep up with the carriers. Now with battleships obviously this doesn't always strictly apply. Um, when you're looking at things like the old standards and basically anything from World War One that isn't a battle cruiser, but the battle cruisers and the fast battleships of the treaty era could either keep up with the carriers, or if they were the 28 knotters, even if they couldn't technically keep up when the carrier was in a full sprint, they could keep close enough. So that that's one issue. Uh, obviously, cruisers also had the speed and the endurance to keep up with the carriers. Um, destroyers theoretically had the speed, but battleships and battle cruisers were much better able to stand with the carriers in the heavier weathers that they might encounter. Cruisers could to a degree, but really heavy weather would drive them back, and destroyers obviously are the most sensitive in terms of how fast they can actually go when the weather really kicks up. So that's the minor factor. The two bigger factors are both to do with the threats faced by carriers. When it comes to the surface threat, you've got to remember that was actually still a legitimate fear for most carriers for a good chunk of of World War II. Now obviously there is the incident of Glorious versus the two Scharnhorsts, but in a more general sense, in the first part of the war, carriers were still seen as something of an ancillary to the main striking elements of the fleet, and they were considered to be especially vulnerable to fast cruisers that could run them down. This is, for instance, is why the Lexingtons carried an 8-inch battery and why various designers kept trying to squeeze an 8-inch battery into subsequent US carrier designs, amongst other things. And a battleship or battle cruiser can stand off those threats pretty comfortably. And obviously, if the enemy comes in with their own fast battleships or battle cruisers, like, say, the Congos, well, then you're going to need that kind of firepower to repel them. Now, you might be thinking, well, surely the carrier would launch an airstrike and that would take care of it. Well... For a good chunk of the war, that's not actually strictly true. Um, you can obviously sink capital ships with mass carrier strikes. However, if the enemy manages to get the drop on you such that you don't have a tremendous amount of warning, and bearing in mind in the early days when radar either didn't exist or was only available on a few ships and was relatively short range anyway, there was always the chance of being jumped by battle cruisers, fast cruisers, or maybe even a relatively swiftly moving battleship or two. And a single carrier's air wing, bearing in mind that they'd have to effectively scramble to arm and spot and launch those aircraft pretty darn quickly, they might damage the incoming ship. If they're lucky, they might even eventually inflict fatal damage, but whether or not they do anything substantial before that ship pulled into gun range and started spraying down the carrier. That's not a bargain that you really want to be taking. Because even if you've only got a 10% chance of that happening, you don't have that many carriers and they're not fast to build. The Essex is, you look at them and you think, oh, hang on, well, they, they could build a lot of them. Yeah, but if you look at how long they took to build, they're still not the fastest ships in the world to build, and that's with the US industry behind them. Um, so... Guarding against surface attack threats was always a major issue, and obviously battleships and battle cruisers are pretty much the heaviest surface defences you can give to a carrier. Now, massed airstrikes at longer ranges obviously have a much better chance of taking out carriers, but up until the 
second half of World War II, and sometimes not even then, having large numbers of carriers together in such a way that they could conduct mass strike operations was actually more rare than it was common. And where you did have those concentrations of carriers, such as the Kirubutai and the various American task groups that were put up against them, those were specific concentrations of force, and they were around for sort of certain battles and such. But when you look at those carriers on operations either side of those specific operations, you'll actually find quite often that there's a carrier or two wandering around on its own doing various bits and pieces. The other aspect is the air threat, whether that be from land-based aircraft or from other carriers. The simple fact is, whilst a carrier has a massive open deck, there is a limit to the number of guns that you can put on a carrier because that big flat open deck does need to be kept clear for you know aircraft operations. Whereas once things really start getting into the swing of it in the middle part of World War II, battleships, which generally don't have to worry about aircraft operations apart from their catapults, have actually got more deck space as a proportion of the total to devote to guns. I mean, that they are floating gun batteries in the first place, and so all of a sudden you have a massive, heavily armoured floating anti-aircraft battery which is very useful on two counts. One, obviously, you can shoot down enemy aircraft and you can create a crossfire, which is quite handy. But also, to a lesser degree, battleships are fairly big, fairly obvious targets. And so if an enemy's coming in down on your carriers, there's every chance that some of their flight elements might get distracted by going after the supposedly big, juicy carrier target, uh, battleship target, sorry, as opposed to the carrier target. And then that splits up the effort and two weaker attacks are much more likely to be defeated than one single larger attack as we saw recently with the battle of the eastern solomons enterprise got quite badly hit by japanese aircraft but to some degree she was saved by the fact that a number of aircraft decided going after uss north carolina was a good idea turned out that was not true and also, a few went after USS Saratoga, was obviously another carrier, and turned out that was an even worse idea. Um, what quite would have happened to Enterprise had all of those dive bombers also gone after her is an open question. But North Carolina serving as a target decoy, effectively, and obviously being heavily armoured and therefore relatively able to stand up to anything that might have gotten through is a useful function as well. And you can see some of this when you look at the relative anti-aircraft batteries. So... If you look at, say, Enterprise, by the mid to late war period, she was carrying around about 90 anti-aircraft guns of varying calibers between 20 and 40 for 20 and 40 millimeter and 5 inch. Whereas if you look at North Carolina, by the same kind of time period, she was carrying, depending on exactly what operation she was on, anything between around about 130, anything up to 150 anti-aircraft gun barrels on top of her. 16 inch main armament so you can see that the concentration of anti-aircraft firepower available aboard the battleship was quite considerable and of course whilst a carrier might be limited in its ability to maneuver if it's trying to recover or launch aircraft the battleship can pretty much do what it likes to obtain a superior defensive firing position like unto buddha asks did ships ever fight using their cross deck guns they did but it tended to be quite rare for a couple of reasons. Firstly, whilst cross-deck firing looks good on paper as a way of getting all the guns, including the wing-mounted turrets, to be able to give a single broadside, the actual firing arcs are quite limited. Now, on some ships, they're less limited than others. Some of the later German ships, for example, before they went all centre-line, had quite wide arcs of fire for ships that had cross-deck firing, and when you compare the Minas Gerais class for Brazil and the Rivadavia class of Argentina, you can see that most of the extra size of the Rivadavias is actually in some ways being utilised to give those guns somewhat better cross-deck firing arcs. And as it turns out, even though everyone's looking for a line of battle engagement, one that doesn't happen quite as often as people wanted it to, and even when it does, 
the enemy usually doesn't cooperate by being nice and lined up at almost perpendicular and parallel to you which then makes it very difficult to actually bring your limited arc cross deck guns into play because if they're out of the arc you either have to maneuver your ship out of line to get that firing in or you have to switch targets or you have to just fire with a partial broadside and hope that the situation will change at some point and you see that in battles like Jutland, the battles of the Falkland Islands and the various battle cruiser engagements you actually see through the battle reports although there are some full salvos fired including the cross deck guns they're very much in the minority the invincible class uh, and indefatigable class which are uh, pretty much all of those engagements in some way shape or form are perhaps some of the best examples of that you look through and there's a handful of full eight gun salvos and an awful lot of six gun salvos the other factor is of course deck damage from the blast of the guns because yeah it looks pretty, but it turns out that firing a massive great 11-inch, 12-inch uh, naval gun across your own deck tends to do relatively nasty things to that deck. Now, the amount of damage incurred could be accepted in wartime during a battle because, to a certain degree, it is cosmetic. It's not threatening the structural integrity of the ship, although I can guarantee you the people in the secondary battery under that gun blast are not going to appreciate you all that much. But it meant that in peacetime, that kind of practice rarely, if ever, happened because they tried it once or twice and go, yeah, in peacetime we can't justify having to fix that all the time. Um, so it would they, they would run some exercises, but very often they'd be a load aim. Oh, and now we would shoot but we're not going to. Um, so ships very often were used to running their broadsides with one or more of their cross-deck firing guns not actually strictly taking part, which did hamper efficiency with those somewhat as well. So effectively, yes, it did, but no, nowhere near as much as the designers of the ships actually hoped for. Eviper10 asks... How effective were secondary batteries in their intended role of anti-torpedo boat or anti-light target work, like taking out destroyers, for example, to, let's say the five-inch guns on US battleships? In their anti-surface role, the effectiveness of secondary batteries kind of waxed and waned as technology improved, as should probably be fairly unsurprising. The compromise that a lot of the time had to be considered was that you were obviously mainly looking at torpedo boats and destroyers so ideally given that they were relatively fast and relatively agile and that well for a good chunk of time uh, central fire control wasn't available for the secondary batteries and that was actually around for a considerably longer period of time than when central fire control came in for the main batteries you were probably looking at maybe only getting a couple of hits, one or two hits in on a given target before it got into torpedo range, at which point it was somewhat academic. If you managed to hit the offending ship afterwards, then, well, good for you, but that ship's probably launched a torpedo or two or more at you, at which point things are going to go hope probably very badly for you. So you do want to hit them as soon as possible. However... You, because the ships are going so quickly and so small, an individual hit is going to be very difficult to score. So you have the problem of if we take more smaller guns, then by sheer number of shots we're likely to hit something. But those individual shells at some point will become so small and so weak that a single shot to a destroyer or a torpedo boat might not slow it down or stop it. And you need to hit with multiple shells, which sort of amplifies the problem even more. Whereas if you go with fewer larger guns, any individual shot will probably stop a destroyer dead in its path. But you've got fewer shots because you've got fewer guns and you've got fewer shots because the gun can't fire as quickly. So the chances of you actually getting that shot in time go down. Add into that for extra flavour the fact that once you get up to around about 
five inches of caliber, you start to get issues with whether or not the hum human gunners can physically load the shells either at all on their own or if they can quickly enough. And so this is why in a lot of countries you see a lot an awful lot of messing around once you hit the kind of five to six inch mark of should our secondary battery when it's still in primary and anti-surface mode should it be a five inch 5.25 inch 5.5 inch six inch and of course then you get the metrics involved so 155 millimeter and so forth and some truly odd calibers as well where the numbers don't really make sense in either metric or imperial but never mind Obviously, originally, the secondary batteries were mainly there to provide a hail of fire against capital ship targets, and they still would get stuck in um, occasionally if the range closed to enough. Um, but against your destroyer, torpedo boat, etc. targets, you tended to find that the idea of one or two shots de delivering crippling damage was probably the more accurate one. But when you look at engagements like, say, what, uh, Battle of Jutland, obviously is the biggest one in World War One. The accuracy of secondary batteries is abysmally bad compared to the accuracy of the main batteries. And uh, to a certain extent, yeah, a lot of them at Jutland don't have central fire control for their secondary batteries. And the secondary batteries in those cases, a lot of most of them are in casements, which are not the world's best gun platforms anyway. So it's perhaps not that surprising. But when you look at various destroyers that are hit, the ones that are hit by the larger caliber secondaries do tend to get stopped by one or two hits and occasionally fatally. So that does kind of bear, bear that out. The larger problem is that as torpedo ranges get greater and greater, um, to be perfectly honest by the time your secondary batteries are engaging you're probably already in a significant amount of danger anyway um, because torpedo ranges between World War One and Two go up quite a bit faster than the secondary battery ranges do even if the secondary batteries get better at shooting things so you see a lot more destroyers and such being engaged by the battleship's main armament as well as the secondary battery so my summary would be they, they tend to have a fairly good deterrent effect but I would certainly not want to be a ship that's relying entirely on just my secondary battery to see off a light craft attack in anything but the most favourable of circumstances. Rookie Mistake asks, Can you explain the definitions of first and second generation dreadnoughts, super dreadnoughts and fast battleships, as well as what ships would fit into those categories? Now, this does come up occasionally, and I think I may have answered it once or twice in previous dry docs, but there's plenty of new subscribers, so... This one probably bears repeating occasionally. Now, the one thing I will emphasize is that practically everybody has their own way of classifying generations of battleships um, in the Dreadnought era. So this is my one. Um, I've seen a few other people use it, uh, but it's not obviously a universally shared one. So if you want to come up with your own or you want to use someone else's, then it's perfectly fine. It's not exactly like I can stop you. Um, but this one makes the most sense to me. So my classification system says first generation dreadnoughts. Well, they're usually the first ones built by a nation. That's fairly self-explanatory. But they generally consist of ships armed with 11 or 12 inch guns. They may have anything from 8 to 12 guns on the ship, but they will have some form of restricted broadside that will usually mean they only actually have a 8-gun broadside. So, for example, with Dreadnought, it's got two wing turrets, so it's got 10 guns, but it can only fire um, 8 in the broadside. USS South Carolina doesn't have any wing guns, but it only has 8 guns, so it's got an 8-gun broadside. Um... Obviously, the Nassau's or the Helgelands, um, they've got 12 guns, but thanks to the hexagonal layout, they can also only get an 8-gun broadside. So that's generally my cl classification for a first-generation Dreadnought. The second-generation Dreadnoughts, I tend to classify as ships that have a 10- to 12-gun broadside, and that can include cross-firing turrets. Um, so even if it's only a possibly a theoretical 
10, uh, 10 or 12 gun broadside they can at least do it on some bearing so hms colossus would be a good example um technically that means actually the u.s navy only has one first generation dreadnought which is south carolina because the floridas the follow ones have a 10 gun broadside because they have them all center line most second generation dreadnoughts will have an all center line armament but as i said not all of them some of them will have uh, cross deck firing instead but again their main guns will all be at this point a second generation ship 12 inch then you have the first generation super dreadnoughts and these are characterized by having a bigger gun battery in terms of caliber than the second generation dreadnoughts so whether that be 13.5 inch whether that be 14 inch or some other odd caliber um, they're a step above the 12 inch dreadnoughts in firepower and they at this point should all have centerline guns no wing turrets no cross firing turrets of any description obviously size is going up at this point so this would be things like uh, USS Texas, the Orion class, the Iron Duke class. And these ships generally will have a 10-gun broadside. It can vary very slightly, but not an awful lot. And under that paradigm, you'd also probably technically squeeze the Nevadas in. Now, the second generation of Super Dreadnoughts, that marks another escalation. So this will either be a move to 15-inch weapons or similar, or a move to considerably more weapons of the previous caliber. So the main run of US Standard class, for example, with their 12, 14-inch guns would count as second generation Super Dreadnoughts, the Queen Elizabeths and the Revenges, the Byernes, etc. The Fusos and the Isays probably also, because again, 12, 14-inch guns. But that second generation Super Dreadnoughts also encompasses the ships that were designed as kind of one-up them because of the intervening war period in World War One that kind of messed things around a little bit. So you get the, the upper, uh, upper end of the second generation Super Dreadnoughts is things like the Nagatos, Nelsons, Colorados, etc. Strictly speaking, you could probably start looking at those as the first treaty battleships, but, but whether they count as the first generation of treaty battleships or the upper end of the second generation Dreadnoughts kind of leave up to personal choice. You then have the main generation of treaty battleships, and those are fairly self-explanatory. They should be, at least on paper, trying to comply with the treaty restrictions. And actually, that leaves them that leaves them as a very, very small grouping, believe it or not, because you're only actually really looking at the King George V as fully treaty compliant. You can also include the North Carolinas under the first escalator clause. The Richelieu's technically are treaty compliant, but not second London naval treaty compliant. And this is where you kind of cross over into the full-on fast battleship. So the fast battleship, where you stick those with the treaty battleships is kind of, again, a bit of a fuzzy line. Fast battleships, you could probably say, are ships that can hit over 30 knots. So Bismarck, Littorio, um, Iowa classes, for example, Vanguard, technically would count as full-on fast battleships, but sometimes people just lump in all the treaty battleships because 28 knots were still considerably faster than previous, the previous generation of ships. And so sometimes everything from King George V all the way up to Yamato gets lumped in with fast battleships so when when you get past sort of the end of the first world war it gets all a little bit fuzzy and you can use some terms interchangeably but i think at least in the run-up from dreadnought through to about 1916 1917 the first second generation dreadnoughts and first second generation super dreadnought naming typology at least for me is fairly clear dr gull 1888 asks 
I was rather surprised to learn that Prince Rupert of the Rhine, whom I recall as a cavalry general, also served as an admiral during the Anglo-Dutch Wars. I know that generals from antiquity were gifted admirals like Pompey the Great or Hannibal, but with the armies and navies of the 17th century, one might think military branches had become rather specialised. So how come? How can a cavalry general become an admiral, especially in the early modern or modern period of history? Was this a common practice? And can you also name some other prominent examples, please? So a lot of this comes down to how you define what the role of an admiral is, and to be perfectly honest, Prince Rupert actually had a far longer and more successful career as a naval commander than he did as a general. Um, now, there are a fair number of other examples. During the Cromwellian period in England, you didn't even have admirals, you technically had generals at sea. Um, so General at Sea, Robert Blake, was actually one of the best admirals England ever produced. Um, and bear in mind, it was still England at this point. Um, and he did very, very well, in fact. Um, tends to get written out of history a little bit because he was part of the Cromwellian period and a lot of the intervening British history tries to play down that period for some reasons that are ideological, some reasons that are somewhat more understandable. But regardless... Both of them were generals first and then got kicked over into the Admiralty, uh, Monk and Blake. They did very well, as I said. And to be honest, this kind of thing, whilst it wasn't common, it wasn't too far unheard of generally across this time period. And as I say, it comes down to how you command as an Admiral. If you are a good, let's say, cavalry officer or, or general in just in, in well, I won't say in general, it sounds a bit redundant, but you know what I mean. Um, an understanding of tactics is vital. If you can understand the tactical situation that's presented, then, especially if you're a cavalry commander, the idea of columns and wheeling your ships around, staying in formation, enveloping the enemy, etc., etc., all of this is actually relatively transferable and aboard a ship because ships obviously take a while to maneuver on the scale of seaborne combat in the age of sail you actually have more time to think about what's happening although obviously the sheer inertia of everything means that you also have less chance to take things back you can't just wheel your entire fleet out of formation instantly the way you might be able to with a cavalry charge that you recognize is about to go horribly wrong but if you've got a good tactical sense to a certain degree, that's a that's a very transferable skill. What you have to do if you are were mainly a land-based commander before and you are now at sea is to focus on the big picture, on the the strategy and tactics of the battle, and not try and micromanage things like your gunnery, the ship handling itself. I you say I want my ship to go over there, but you have to both have and rely on a cadre of very experienced long-term naval officers and non-commissioned uh, men who actually know how to handle the ships and will do what you ask them to do. Um, obviously, if you are an admiral who has spent their entire life at sea and understands how ships work back to front, you can eke out a little bit more performance from your ships because you'll understand a few sort of tricks and and little touches that might allow you to exploit the particular capabilities of your your ships to a degree that perhaps a, a more land-based or previously land-based admiral might not immediately understand but certainly at this period it's it's possible for someone who just understands how to fight a war and how to fight a battle to command at sea reasonably well and they might discover they have a bit of a knack for it as well and they'll pick things up over time it can, of course, go horribly wrong um, if the Admiral doesn't grasp the differences between land and sea-based warfare. And, of course, as time goes on and technology advances, it becomes more and more important to have an Admiral who understands the full technological capabilities of the ship and the fleet that he's on. Um, but this is probably around about the 17th century, it's around about the last period where you could reliably take a good land-based General and turn him into a passable Admiral.
4L3KS asks, with regards to USS Birmingham, you mentioned that her 6-inch guns were firing during the air attack. Were the Cleveland 6-inch guns dual purpose, or was it a Bismarck main battery situation, i.e. shooting at the water to throw up splashes in the way of low-flying aircraft? So with the Cleveland class, Birmingham was actually trying to engage the aircraft with its 6-inch guns. Now, the 6-inch on the Cleveland was not strictly a dual-purpose weapon. The, strictly the first dual-purpose 6-inch gun deployed on a US cruiser was on the Worcester class. However, the Clevelands could kind of use their 6-inch guns in an AA role under certain circumstances. This was because the high-explosive shell that they carried, or HC high-capacity shell in US speak at the time, could be fitted with either a time detonation fuse or even a, a VT fuse, a, a proximity fuse. Um, and so with the, combine that with the fact that the guns could elevate initially as designed up to around about 40 degrees, which doesn't sound like an awful lot, but for long range AA is okay-ish. Um, and later modifications would allow them to elevate up to 60 degrees exactly where the Cleveland ha uh, where the Birmingham had had that 60 degree elevation modification at the time um, I don't know offhand but in either case Cle uh, the Cleveland class in general and Birmingham in particular they were able to engage in a form of anti-aircraft fire with their six inch guns and obviously if you're being attacked by torpedo craft uh, torpedo fight, uh, bombers, fighters coming in, trying to do low-level drops, etc. Basically anything that's not a dive bomber, you can use that elevation of guns to defend yourself. And even with dive bombers, with the range of a six-inch gun, you can certainly engage, engage them at least when they're further out um, and try and hit them that way. Connor McLernan asks, what technology would you say was the largest revolution in naval technology in the last 100 years? Now, see, if you'd asked me in the 100 years that the channel mainly covers, I would give you a completely different answer. But if you're asking about the last 100 years, that means from 1920 onwards. And if you're going to ask for that, I would probably say radar. Because radar, I mean... Some people might argue missiles, but the thing is, without radar, there's very little point to having missiles. <laughs> radar enables those, especially when you're talking about the ship-launched variety, um, and also the ones, most of the ones you send out ships. Um, the other thing is, even before that, radar is a complete game-changer when it comes to the types of engagement that you can partake in. And the, the ranging finding aspect maybe not quite so much in and of itself because optical range finding technology was an incredibly advanced science by World War II and some ships that only had uh, optical range finders for their range finding such as the Latorios and the Yamato actually achieved ridiculously good um, accuracy at long range with just optical fire control technology but it's the weather aspect and in naval terms night is a form of weather um, where radar comes into its own because radar allows you to see an enemy coming at night um, once the range has got up to a decent amount regardless of the cover of darkness and the cover of darkness has been a massive issue for millennia of human combat um, it also means that in things like rain and snow and sleet and fog, etc., all these other things where in previous naval engagements you couldn't see your enemy and probably your enemy couldn't see you and it was all a little bit of sort of blind people groping in the dark. Now you could see. Now you could work out where the enemy was. You could take ranging information and if the enemy didn't have their own radar or if their radar was less capable than yours or you managed to jam it or it had been knocked out or switched off or any of these other things, you had such a massive tactical advantage. Um, I mean, the decisions to use AP and HE shells aside, which was another major factor, USS Johnston, for example, at the Battle of Samar was able to duck in and out of squalls and rain where the Japanese couldn't see it 
properly and therefore couldn't shoot at it accurately, but it was able to return fire consistently and accurately with its 5-inch guns because it had radar and the fire control systems to use it. Uh, likewise, Scharnhorst at the Battle of the North Cape was pretty much ambushed at almost point-blank range by Duke of York because Duke of York could see it on radar and Scharnhorst's radar was broken courtesy of HMS Norfolk. Obviously, the the tailing of Bismarck for a long time was run by HMS Suffolk and her radar set. Matapan was enabled, at least the night part of it, by the Royal Navy's use of radar, and so on and so on and so on. Um, so, yeah, radar's the, the, probably the single biggest game-changer in terms of naval technology in the last hundred years or so. Jerry2357 asks, It strikes me as being rather unusual that the Allies had two light cruisers called Birmingham, both armed with 12 6-inch guns, in service at the same time. Were there any other cases of such naming coincidences between the US Navy and the Royal Navy? There were a few overlaps, none quite as um, on the nose as the uh, the two Birminghams, both, as you mentioned, being uh, light cruisers with 12 6-inch guns. But, for example, there were uh, two Enterprises. There was obviously USS Enterprise CV-6, and there was HMS Enterprise, which was an Emerald-class uh, light cruiser both in service at the same time. There was the USS Newark, another Cleveland class, and HMS Newark, which ironically enough was a Wix class destroyer, formerly USS Ringold, which had been transferred to the Royal Navy. They were both in service at the same time. An awful lot of these are going to be town names because obviously the of the uh, British, original British 13 colonies being part of um, the the founding of the United States, so there's a lot of commonality where people name things after stuff that they'd either come from or left behind, depending on your point of view. There was a British uh, trawler, HMS Flint, and the Atlanta-class cruiser USS Flint, both in service at the same time. There was another one of the transferred destroyers named HMS Richmond, which corresponded with USS Richmond, which was, ironically enough, an Omaha-class cruiser that had originally been designed to operate with the now HMS Richmond that had previously been USS Fairfax. There was a minesweeper HMS Boston, which was in service at the same time as the USS Boston, which was a Baltimore-class cruiser. There was a very, very few months overlap between HMS Intrepid, which was a destroyer, and the USS Intrepid, uh, the Essex-class carrier. Unfortunately, then HMS Intrepid was sunk by air attack, so that pairing didn't last very long. And the US paddle wheel training carrier HM uh, USS Wolverine had a counterpart in HMS Wolverine, which was a small destroyer. Um, yeah, there's a few others in the smaller cat ship categories, but those are probably the main ones. And then we have a question. Do you take interest in modern warships? If so, what would be your favourite ship of our modern era? I do take an interest in modern warships, but as I've said before, the channel doesn't cover them for two primary reasons. One of which is talking about modern warships and means inevitably getting involved in discussions about modern politics or modern wars that obviously have a strong recent political influence, which I don't want to do, because no one ever comes out of a political discussion looking good. Um, and secondly, because the capabilities of the systems are always heavily classified, so a lot of the time I would only either be able to give you, well, we think it could do this, or um, maybe it can do this, or... They say it can do this, and none of those are probably actually in any way accurate, which irritates me. Um, so yeah, those are the two reasons that I don't cover them on this channel, but I do take an interest in, and keep up with them. Um, if you want to hear the speculation about how and when, the, what those capabilities might be and how they might evolve, uh, I do also do a, a podcast, as I've mentioned before, with Dr. Alexander Clark and Jamie Seidel from Armoured Carriers, where we do talk about modern stuff, but... As I say, that's a, a podcast, and you can safely take uh, that a lot of what we talk about is obviously speculation rather than definitive, and so that's, I think, the appropriate place for it. In terms of what would be my favourite ship of the modern era at the moment, I think I'm pretty much locked in on the Sejong the Great class destroyers from South Korea, purely because they've taken... 
the uh, the approach that's seen in well anything from the Kirov to the Ali Burke of let's have lots of missiles, and then they've sat there and gone, yeah, but but what if we had more? Um, <laughs> that they just carry such a ridiculous amount of armament, it appeals greatly to my inner pyromaniac and my uh, outer engineer. That they're just a wonderful example of. Lots of firepower in a non battle cruiser sized hull. Uh, I, I do like them for that basis because, yeah, who, who doesn't like being able to fling well over 100 missiles at somebody? Miko Leitnan asks Has the sinking of a formation flagship ever caused difficulties in continuing operations because of loss of essential plans, paperwork, flag, bridge equipment, or staff? Did formations have backups of essential items or papers on other ships in case the flagship is sunk? The sinking of flagships is usually something that's very bad. Um, so yes, the sinking of formation flagships are very, very often they do cause difficulties. Um, it, now, obviously, there is a certain element to when the flagship is sunk. So... Uh, for example, the picture you can see here, the sinking of HMS Victoria by HMS Camperdown. That didn't take place during a battle. That was obviously a case of um, not friendly fire, because there wasn't fire involved. Friendly impact. Um, and it took Admiral Tryon and a lot of his papers down with him. Now, that was a problem. I mean, obviously it was an inconvenience at the time for the Victoria and her crew, but it was a problem going forward because... By taking Admiral Tryon and all of his paperwork down with it, it made it very difficult for the Board of Inquiry to figure out what the heck had actually just happened, other than the obvious, and why um, it happened. So that's kind of a peacetime issue. Then you've got issues of flagships potentially being sunk before they get to a battle zone. Um, that is more a thing that ha tends to happen in World War Two, but for for example, Admiral Karita, on his way to the Battle of Samar, had his flagship, the cruiser Atago, blown out from under him by a US submarine. And so he ended up having to be fished out of the water um, and popped aboard the Yamato, which, looking back on it, he probably should have been on in the first place. Um, now, that did involve a loss of some material. The Admiral obviously survived, but that loss... Um, did and has been used as some of the evidence as to why Admiral Karita made some of the slightly weird decisions he did. Because, well, to be perfectly honest, it's probably a fairly traumatic event to have a ship blown out from under you by a torpedo and then to try and re-establish all your planning now down several ships aboard a completely different ship um, without a lot of your paperwork and obviously, having been hauled across um, with all the all the in, being chucked off a sinking ship entails, it can be a fairly traumatic experience. So um, the fact that he wasn't necessarily operating at one hundred percent was somewhat forgivable, but it's a, it's a, certainly a potential explanation. Um, then you also have to account for flagships that actually lost in action. Now, whether that causes a problem because of loss of plans and paperwork and equipment to a certain extent does depend greatly on both the admiral and the other captains so in a navy that's very regimented all the orders come from the top down or a navy that has low morale or a navy where the admiral just doesn't share his plans and assumes that everyone must follow him and he is immortal it can and has in the past caused major major issues um and there's also usually the fact that the Admiral tends to be on one of the bigger and more impressive ships, so seeing that go up with the Admiral on board can have a fairly devastating morale effect as well. Now, part of the uh, situation at Trafalgar, for example, actually shows both sides of things. Admiral Villeneuve aboard the Bucentar, effectively the Bucentar got taken out of action by the victory in the opening moments of the, of the main engagement. That to a certain extent, probably contributed to the fact that the Franco-Spanish fleet, in large part, acted like it really didn't have a leader for most of the battle, which helped the the British fleet win. 
On the other hand, obviously Nelson, um, although Victory doesn't get sunk, Nelson does get killed in the battle, but because Nelson has this habit of telling everybody what he wants them to do ahead of time, usually in explicit detail, usually with a certain degree of, and if that doesn't go quite as you expected, then do this, um, plus giving some underlying principles and giving his captains the freedom of action, all of that adds up to, well, yeah, he gets killed, doesn't actually manifestly affect the way the British Navy's fighting that battle. Apart from anything, most of the ships don't even realise that he's dead until well after the battle. They're, they're just following the, the orders he gave them ahead of time. Um, and they had, I say, they had the freedom of action to cope with unexpected reverses and setbacks. So that's two completely different sides of the coin. Um, but if you want another example, again, it's not sunk, but um, when... Admiral McCower's flagship at the First Battle of Savo Island takes a hit and that wipes out the chart room. That has the only copy of the decent charts in that particular squadron, um, which does contribute somewhat to their decision to withdraw to the north after savaging the, the Allied cruisers. So, yeah, there were some things that formations didn't actually have copies of, but exactly what they didn't have copies of depended, as I say, very much on the Admiral in question, and to a certain extent the time period, and whether or not they'd be able to cope without the flagship. Again, depends quite a lot on the Navy and time period in question. Some navies, if the flagship gets destroyed, would just turn around and go, well, I guess we're out for vengeance for him as well then, and lay into you all the harder. And at the other extreme, some navies seeing the flagship in difficulty or destroyed would just go, oh, the day is lost, and just leave, even if they were actually technically overall winning, um, which did happen in a few cases. The wonderfully named Send Penguins asks, Given the problems that poor quality coal was giving the high seas fleet, particularly exemplified by the experience at Jutland, where fuel quality seems to have offered strategic as well as tactical drawbacks for the engineering plants of several vessels, why didn't the high seas fleet invest in coking ovens to improve the burning quality of the fuel they had available? Was it simply cost, both for creating and storing the coke, or were there other reasons that replacing poor quality coal with coke from the same co made from the same coal would be a poor trade-off? Effectively, it comes down to the circumstances that Germany found itself in at the start of World War One. Germany had previously exported an awful lot of coal to other countries and imported more coal, obviously the higher end coal for its ships. With the supply of high quality coal cut off and the entire country now on a war footing, Germany very rapidly began to experience coal shortages to the point where, hilariously enough, if you can get your head around it, because of the different grades of coal having different efficiencies, you ended up with coal mines being shut down because of the lack of coal. Not the lack of coal in the mines, but the lack of sufficient quality coal to drive the engines that were supposed to take the coal from the coal mines to other places. And similarly, the transport of lower grade coal around the country was ground to a halt by the lack of higher grade coal to haul that coal in engines all across Germany. Uh, obviously this situation got worse and worse as the war went on. And when you look at the process of making coke, um, then you end up with a slight problem that one for every, say, 100 tonnes of coal you put in, you get around about 75 tonnes of coke out. And with the really horrible coal that characterises a lot of German coal seams, even less. On top of that, the coke that was being produced was desperately needed for the steel industry to make more guns, etc. And uh, so diverting coke away from that would starve the weapon munitions industries, which obviously you don't want to do in the middle of a war, especially when you consider just how much fuel a battleship burns, let alone an entire fleet of them. And to cap it all off was the fact that not only do you lose, obviously, mass when you turn coal into coke, but you have to burn other fuel, i.e. more coal, to generate the heat to 
turn the coal that's actually in the coking furnace into coke. So you're going to end up probably using two, three, maybe even four times or more as much coal to generate a bit of coke as you would just using the coal. And at the end of the day, that means that when you've got an entire country that's facing coal shortages, you kind of just have to suck it up and go, well, we'd rather have much, much more low-grade coal so that our entire fleet can steam around, albeit with some restrictions, than ploughing vast amounts of Germany's limited coal stocks into making coke, which will allow your fleet to sail around a lot less because you've got less of it, albeit with a somewhat cleaner and more efficient way of sailing. And obviously, I can understand that would raise questions of why didn't they at least keep a reserve of coke in order to give them good sailing during battle conditions or something like that. But again, it just comes down to the sheer scale of operation, because if you're going to supply the entire high seas fleet with, let's say, 500 tonnes of coke for battle condition sailing, um, then you've got to multiply that up by every capital ship in the fleet, then multiply it up by the smaller amounts you're going to need on the cruisers and on the destroyers. Rapidly, you're going to need tens of thousands of tons of coke, all of which is in desperately high demand and which will consume even more tens of thousands of tons of fuel of coke of coal to produce. And how often are you going to use it? Are you going to use it at Dogger Bank to get the battle cruisers away from the British fa faster? In which case, you need to replenish it. If you're only going to use it at Jutland, then that means all the other operations that you're sailing around with are now curtailed somewhat because they have this sort of holy store of coke, which they can't touch unless a major fleet battle arrives, which decreases the operational range of the ships. And also you've got to take into account that unlike oil, coal just kind of sits there. You can't open a tap and say, right, well, the... Um, with with the coal now flows so if you're going to have this rarely used valuable resource where is that going to be stored is it going to be stored in a coal bunker right next to the the boilers in which case you can access it quite quickly during battle but then that means that your day-to-day -day operations shoveling the coal from further away bunkers is going to be a lot more backbreaking or do you stash it away in a coal bunker somewhere near the bow or stern of the ship because you're not going to need it that often but then that means when you do sail into battle it's going to be an absolute pig of a job to get it all to the boilers so all of these complications add up to basically why the germans never really bothered looking into using coke as a fuel source instead of the uh, rather sticky bitumous coal that they had jonathan smith asks the Yorktown class carriers were originally built with additional arresting cables on the bow and a requirement for high speed astern, thus allowing landings at the bow if the aft deck was damaged. Were any other carriers built to land planes over the bow? And aside from this and the post-war rubber deck trials, were there any other weird and wonderful carrier landing methods that were actually tried? Practically all US carriers from the Lexington and Saratoga through to the Essexes um, up to the end of World War II, at least in theory, had the capability to land aircraft on the bow while the ship was in reverse. Um, or indeed, I guess, sailing forward if you really wanted to try it, try it that way. Um, some of them didn't have the forward bow arrestor cables installed, but as a ship, the capability was actually there in terms of the high reverse speed. It wasn't a particularly fun activity, um, but it could be done. Uh, one combat example would be the USS Saratoga CV-3, which was damaged in the later part of World War II. Well, it's damaged several times, but in this particular case in later World War II, it was damaged at the stern, and it recovered a number of aircraft across the bow um, on the bow arrestor cables that had been installed specifically for the purpose. And uh, generally, that, that seemed to work relatively well. Now, as far as other interesting ways of landing aircraft on a carrier go, well, look at some of the early 
um, carriers, they have some really bizarre ideas that for fairly obvious reasons didn't pan out. I mean, <clears throat> one of the earliest forms of arrestor cable, instead of having winches and springs, was literally um, a rope between two sandbags. Um, there was also the aircraft comes in so slowly that people run along the deck and grab leather loops on the wings and try and pull it out of the sky a technique, which, yeah, that, that didn't work particularly well and was abandoned very early on in aircraft care experimentation. And there have been also somewhat questionable ideas about launching float planes from a carrier's deck by greasing either the deck or the floats of the aircraft and then trying to, according to some sources, some people actually thought repeating the process at the other end of the carrier might work out. Um, I guess no one really got the memo that you need friction to slow down when landing. Um, so, fortunately, I don't think anyone tried that one. It was just a suggestion. They ended up uh, with the seaplanes landing near the carrier and being picked up by Crane. And one of the ideas that was thought up in the early jet age, although, again, fortunately, it doesn't appear to have actually been tried in reality, but was discussed in some circles, mainly in response to the much increased weight and landing speed of early jet aircraft, was actually to fit uh, jets with kind of a reverse version of a JATO or RATO booster. And so when they came in over the deck, the pilot was supposed to trigger these Rock, effectively rockets that pointed forwards, uh, i.e. the exhaust pointed forwards, which in theory would drop the airspeed of the aircraft sufficiently and sufficiently quickly that they could then drop down onto the carrier's deck at a reasonable speed. Um, and yeah, that there, there was a lot of correspondence from people who knew better pointing out that probably putting what is going to be almost certainly an unbalanced source of rocket propulsion pointing forwards on an aircraft that's already at a relatively close to its stall speed whilst trying to land on a moving target like a carrier and is therefore probably going to punch the pilot forward into the instrument panel when it kicks off it is probably not a viable system but can't blame them for trying or <laughs> Well, you can blame them for trying, um, and they would have been blamed for trying. I suppose you can't blame them for thinking about it, at least. Matt Kidd asks, What was the smallest ship sunk by the main battery of a 20th century battleship? Well, this probably ignites the whole debate over what exactly is classed as a ship. Um, but in terms of active operational warships, because if you really want to get down to it, you've, you'll have things like the various landing craft that were smashed up by one of the British R-class in its attack on Cherbourg, which some of them are going to weigh barely anything, considering that they're, some of them were designed to ferry troops from larger landing craft to the shoreline. Um, but one, well, several Japanese torpedo boats were sunk at the Battle of Tsushima, some of which were of this kind. Um, this one particular model is from the Austro-Hungarian Navy because I couldn't find any pictures of the Japanese ones, but um, identical ones in service to the Japanese Navy were sunk, at least one of which was fired on by battleship's main arm shortly before it vanished. Um, and as you can see, they are not the world's largest of vessels. Um, they weigh about 80 to 90 tons soaking wet, so yeah, that that's probably in the running because I'd I doubt you're going to find that many things that A, class a ship, and B, would be dumb enough to try and take on a battleship or even be in the vicinity of an angry battleship and weigh even less than that. Old Richard asks, the final question for this week, was the inception and arrangement of ABDA command a deliberately suicidal, i.e. knowingly doomed, rearguard action conceived by professional officers or a purely political sop to the Dutch government in exile. The thing you have to remember with uh, the ABDA command was that, on paper, it actually had the strength to throw the Japanese out of its operational zone as long as the Japanese fleet didn't show up in either mass numbers or with capital ships. 
if you add together the number of cruisers and destroyers that were technically available, it was a quite a formidable force, albeit a fair number of them were somewhat older. However, the as you can probably tell from this map, it's a huge area to cover. Those forces were scattered and never actually coalesced into a single large fleet. The biggest fleet that they managed to put together was the, the one that obviously Admiral Dorman led. But ABDA command was a considerably larger command than just the naval strike force. And Admiral Dorman wasn't the senior most naval officer in charge of the naval forces. He was just, well, just, he was the senior officer present in that particular element of the naval forces. So, uh, it was in a lot of ways, you could see him, he's sort of like, he's like, say, Admiral Fletcher or Admiral Halsey. He's not the, 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 they aren't the senior admirals in the US Navy, but they are the senior admirals in that task force, therefore they are in command. And the same thing with Admiral Dorman. Um, all the other higher ranking admirals that were involved in ABDA command just weren't there. And since command goes to the senior most officer, he, he got command. Um, in terms of whether it was doomed from the start, and, well, again, in theory, ABDA command as a whole, as well as the naval forces in particular, had a lot of force. But again, scattered over a wide area, not trained together, representing four different nations, all of which have wildly diverging interests, and desperately trying to come up with some kind of coherent plan of action in the space of a few weeks, whilst the Japanese, who have kind of been planning for this for a while, and whilst the Army and the Navy do kind of hate each other, they are at least working towards the same goal, at least on paper, um, are bearing, breathing down their necks. So, yeah, it didn't quite work out as well as it should have. And this is one of the things where it's always important to remember the human factors, and unfortunately, in this case, the political factors, because, as I say, if, if on paper the entire ABDA command fleet assembled from all the various and disparate ports where it was stationed, it should, on paper, have rolled over the Japanese forces at the various uh, engagements that they fought, but instead it actually turned out the other way around, which was obviously very unfortunate for the Allied naval forces in question. So, on a purely practical level, the idea... I don't think was doomed. The idea could have been made to work, but the Japanese, like all good opponents, didn't give them enough time to to make it work. They didn't give them enough time to get the coordination in play. They didn't give them enough time for the various nations to get reinforcements into the area. They didn't give them enough time for all the forces, theoretically, under the command to consolidate. And this is why the enemy gets a vote in, in all situations, even if we wouldn't necessarily want them to. And they obviously the Japanese ended up winning the day and that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock thank you very much for listening just a couple of bits of channel admin are that uh, well both of which I'd kind of like your opinion and feedback on in the comments below if you don't mind now one of them is to do with the giveaway codes that I periodically get uh, now from wargaming for those of you who play world of warships as you'll probably know I have tried posting them for people to have in the community tab they are each code is apparently a single use code but as you might imagine with there being so many of you out there um they end up going very very quickly and then a lot of people end up trying to use them and finding that they no longer function which is obviously frustrating for everybody so what i'm proposing to do is, and I'm going to have a look into whether or not I can do this um, 100%, but for the next lot that come up, what I'm thinking of doing is putting them in as zero-cost items in the in my Etsy store. I need to check with Wargaming if they'll let me do that, because um, they are being given away for free, and I am publicising them to the general audience. The idea then being that I can set an item limit of one, um, which means that each person will be able to claim a single code, get that code, and obviously once everyone has claimed their codes, it will show as sold out, so we won't... Well, people will be disappointed that they aren't any more available, but they won't be disappointed by the fact they think they've got a code and it doesn't actually work. 
Um, so let me know what you think about that, or if you have anyone happens to know of any decent kind of online bits of software where you can kind of drop codes in and say, right, give these away one at a time to unique users until they run out, then yeah, let me know and I'll see about if I can maybe use that. But again, feedback appreciated. The other thing is that, um, as you know, I've been uh, collecting various uh, naval albums of, um, <laughs> with a lot of photos, which I am now. Now that the scanner has arrived, I'm in the process of slowly scanning in, um, albeit a lot faster than it used to be. Now, as part of that, I've come across a number of very, very nice original um, sketches and, and drawings by a couple of fairly well-known naval historians dash naval artists from back from the uh, turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Obviously, I now own these. They are the originals, so I can pretty much do what I like with them. Um, but given how nice and detailed they are, and they're really, trust me, they are really, really nice drawings, I'm thinking of making them available as um, posters, kind of like I've done with the Fleet Air Arm artwork and the HMS Thunderchild poster, etc. And once again, I will try my level best to get you as good a quality, um, as good quality posters for as minimum price as possible. But this does lead me to one major question, which is that with the posters at a three size, they pretty much have to be sent in a uh, cardboard tube, which means sending them as a small parcel. And that, as of late, has really gotten insane when it comes to shipping them to the, especially to the US. Um, within the UK, a small parcel like that can be shipped for about three, three pounds sixty. Um, so it's not too bad postage cost. Shipping them overseas, actually, especially I say, especially to the US, cost nine to ten pounds. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that is quite steep. Um, and uh, I haven't charged the full amount for that shipping uh, historically, but. The question is, would you, as the people who would end up acquiring them, prefer to have them at A3, which is obviously bigger, looks nicer, um, and I'll try and see if I can work something out on, on the shipping there, or would you prefer to have them at A4, which is of course half the size, it's small, it's a lot, it's considerably small, obviously at half, 50% the size, but at um, that size, they can be sent as a large letter in UK postal terms. And that involves basically them sending them in a stiff card-backed envelope, which at that point, um, the shipping costs drop dramatically. They go down by about 75% in the UK, for into UK shipping, and overseas as well, actually. The cost of shipping is massively, massively less than for a small parcel. Or should I maybe do a combination of both? Um, it's it's kind of up to you. Obviously, the A4 posters will cost less than the A3s as well anyway. Um, so there's that to take take into account. Um, but yeah, it's basically, I want to know what you guys think. If you would prefer the bigger ones, um, and obviously with the, with the attendant uh, shipping issues, shipping costs, the other thing, of course, is that uh, the shipping costs for the small parcel that's just standard shipping um recorded shipping with a small parcel is absolutely ridiculous when it comes to shipping transatlantic um whereas the smaller ones obviously they could be done uh with full tracked and signed delivery etc without breaking the bank as it were or as i say if people have other ideas again feel free to chime in because i mean i personally if it if i was in your position, I always prefer a bigger poster that has more detail um, on it. So I would prefer the A3, but I could look into other things like maybe getting a, a US distributor um, that I can ship a whole bunch to, because weirdly enough, when it, when it comes to things like posters, it might cost, let's say, nine or ten pounds to send an A3 poster, single A3 poster to the States. But if I send a wadge of 50, it 
probably only costs about 15 quid. Um, so if I can find a distributor in the United States and then send them a, a sort of a packing list um, with a bunch of prepaid postage, they can post them internally within the US, which should bring the price down, price of shipping down considerably. Although obviously there would be something of a delay because it would have to ship from here to the US, be picked up and then shipped again in t inside the US. Um, and obviously shipping them in sections would mean that I wouldn't be able to dispatch each one as it came in sort of within a day or two of, of the order being placed. I would have to maybe ship them out at the end of a week or something. So factor in the actual cost of the, the time of transportation and it could lead to a sort of two, three week delay in actual arrival. But anyway, I'm probably getting far too complex and think, think overthinking this. But again, you guys are the ones who may potentially want to see these things so i will as best i can abide by your wishes so again let me know what you think is the best way of going